The Red Book by Carl Jung, Chapter 2. Refinding the Soul. And before we get started, I want to just remind you from a little bit from last week, from Chapter 1, that this work is referred to as the confrontation of the unconscious. And a big takeaway from last week's discussion was how important it is to follow the voice inside of your own self. And that what's right for that person is not right for someone else. So, anyway, let's get started. Refinding the soul. When I had a vision of the flood in October of the year 1913, it happened at a time that was significant for me as a man. At that time, in the 40th year of my life, I had achieved everything that I had wished for myself. I had achieved honor, power, wealth, knowledge, and every human happiness. Then my desire for the increase of these trappings ceased. The desire abetted from me, and horror came over me. This is from a handwritten draft called Dear Friends. The draft was in his lecture of the ETH in June 14, 1935, where Hume noted, a point exists at about 35th year when things begin to change. It is the first moment of the shadow side of life, of that going down to death. It is clear that Dante found this point and those who have read Zarathustra will know that Nietzsche has also discovered it. When this turning point comes, people meet in several ways. Some turn away from it, others plunge into it, and something important happens to yet others from the outside. But if we do not see a thing, fate does it to us. Hmm. Back to it. The vision of the flood seized me, and I felt that the spirit of the depths, but I did not understand him. On October 27, 1913, Jung wrote to Freud, breaking off relations with him and resigning as editor of the Jarbuk for Psychosin. I'm not, I'm just going to butcher him, not going to say it. Um, Yet he drove me on with unbearable inner longing, and I said, My soul, where are you? Do you hear me? I speak. I call you. Are you there? I have returned. I am here again. I have shaken the dust off all the lands from my feet, and I have come to you. I am with you. <clears throat> After long years of long wandering, I have come to you again. Should I tell you everything I have seen, experienced, and drunk in? Or do you not want to hear about all the noise of life and the world? But again, one thing you have must know. The one thing I have learned is that one must live this life. This life is the way, the long sought after way to the unfathomable which we call divine. This affirmation, this affirmation occurs a number of times in Jung's later writings. Notes on a talk given by Jung is Analytical Psychology of Religion. That was a, a work that he did in 19, or that came out in 1972. Um, There is no other way. All other ways are false paths. I found the right way. It led me to you, to my soul. I returned, tempered, and purified. Do you still know me? How long the separation lasted? Everything has become so different. And how did I find you? How strange my journey was. 
What words should I use to tell you on what twisted paths a good star has guided me to you? Give me your hand, my almost forgotten soul. How warm the joy at seeing you again, you long disavowed soul. Life has led me back to you. Let us thank the life I have lived for all the happy and all the sad hours, for every joy, for every sadness. My soul, my journey should continue with you. I will wander with you and ascend to my solitude. Jung later described his personal transformation at this time as an example of the beginning of the second half of life, which frequently marked a return to the soul. After the goals and ambitions of the first half of life have been achieved, the turning point of life. The spirit of the depths forced me to say this, and at that same time to undergo it against myself, since I had not expected it then. I still labored misguidedly under the spirit of this time and thought differently about the human soul. I thought and spoke much of the soul. I knew many learned words for her, I had judged her, and I had turned her into a scientific project, or object. Jung is referring here to his earlier work. For example, he had written in 1905, through the association's experiment, we are at least given the means to pave the way for the experimental research of the mysteries of the sick soul. I did not consider that my soul cannot be the object of my judgment and knowledge. Much more are my judgment and knowledge the objects of my soul. In the 1921 psychological tapes, Jung noticed that in psychology, conceptions are a product of the subjective psychological constellation of the researcher. This reflexivity formed an important theme in his later work. Therefore, the spirit of the depths forced me to speak to my soul, to call upon her as a living and self-existing being. I had to become aware that I had lost my soul. From this, we learn how the spirit of the depths considers the soul. He sees her as a living and self-existing being. It's interesting that he referred to his soul as a her, right? With this, he contradicts the spirit of this time for whom the soul is a thing dependent on man, which lets herself be judged and arranged and whose circumference we can grasp. I had to accept that what I had previously called my soul was not at all my soul, but a dead system. The draft continues, a dead system that I have contrived, assembled from so-called experiences and judgments. Hence, I had to speak to my soul as to something far off and unknown, which did not exist through me, but through whom I existed. He whose desire turns away from outer things reaches the place of the soul. In 1913, Jung called the process of introversion of the libido. If he does not find the soul, 
the horror of emptiness will overcome him and fear will drive him with a whip lashing time and again in a desperate endeavor and a blind desire for the hollow things of the world. He becomes a fool through his endless desire and forgets the way of his soul, never to find her again. He will run after all things and will seize hold of them, but he will not find his soul. Since he would find her only in himself, truly his soul lies in things and men, but the blind one seizes things and men, yet not his soul in things and men. He has no knowledge of his soul. He could, excuse me, how could he tell her apart from things and men? He could find his soul in desire itself, but not in the objects of desire. If he possessed his desire, and his desire did not possess him, he would lay a hand on his soul. Since his desire is the image and expression of the soul. I'm going to reread that again. I think, I think there's something there. If he possessed his desire, and his desire did not possess him, he would lay a hand on his soul since his desire is the image and expression of his soul. In 1912, Jung had written, it is a common error to judge longing in terms of the quality of the object. Nature is only beautiful on account of the longing and love accorded to it by man. The aesthetic attributes emanating therefrom apply first and foremost to the libido, which alone accounts, which alone accounts for beauty of nature. If we possess the image of a thing, we possess half the thing. The image of the world is half the world. He who, he who possesses the world, but not its image, possesses only half of the world, since his soul is poor and has nothing. The wealth of the soul exists in images. The psychological tapes, Jung articulated this primacy, primacy of the image through his notion of essence in anemia. In her diary notes, Carrie Barnes commented on this passage. What struck me especially was what you said about the build being half the world. That is the thing that makes humanity so dull. They have misunderstanding that thing. The world that is the thing that holds them wrapped. Das Bill. They have never seriously considered unless they have been poets. He who possesses the image of the world possesses half the world, even in his even if his humanity is poor and owns nothing. The draft continues. He who strives only for things will sink into poverty as outer wealth increases, and his soul will be afflicted by protracted illness. But hunger makes the soul into a beast that devours the unbearable, and it is poisoned by it. My friends, it is wise to nourish the soul, otherwise you will breed dragons and devils in your heart. The draft continues. This parable about refinding the soul, my friends, is meant to show you that you have only seen me as half a man since my soul had lost me. I am certain that you did not notice this 
because how many are with their souls today? Yet, without the soul, there is no path that leads beyond these times. In her diary notes, Carrie Baines commented on this passage on February 8, 1924. I came to your conversation with your soul. All that you say is said in the right way, and it is sincere. It is no cry of the young man awaking, awakening into life but that of the mature man who has lived fully and richly in ways of the world and yet knows almost abruptly one night, say that he has missed the essence. The vision came at the height of your power when you could have gone on just as you were with perfect worldly success. I do not know how you were strong enough to give it heed. I am really for everything you say and understand. Everyone who has lost the connection with his soul or has known how to give it life ought to have a chance to see this book. Every word so far lives for me and strengthens me just where I feel weak. But as you say, the world is a very far away from it in mood today. That does not matter too much. A book can swing even a whole world if it is written in fire and blood. That's the end of the chapter. There's some nuggets in there. Let me know what stood out to you.